Hi, everyone, and thank you to Amberly BI for putting together uh, this webinar. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, I'm sure I don't need to convince any of you about uh, why uh, computing is great or why high performance computing is great. I've just listed some examples here, uh, you know, some pictures of a black hole in physics, obviously in biology, uh, protein structures comes to mind. Um, it can even like help fight climate change, like for example, artificial intelligence. So lots of brilliant applications. What will interest us today is the cost of that. So just a few figures, uh, electricity production, it's 40% of energy related greenhouse gas emission uh, globally. Uh, and if we focus on data centers, it's hard to have an accurate estimate, but one that seems quite sensible is around 100 megaton of CO2 per year the global carbon footprint of data centers. And for context, that's equivalent to uh, the entire American commercial aviation. So that's a bit of a problem, uh, obviously for the impact on climate change. Uh, you know, the pictures on the left here, they're pictures from uh, bushfires in Australia in January, 2020. Um, that's how this project started. In the middle, you've got a temperature increase in the UK. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, puts together a lot of metrics about the health impact. One is 4.2 million deaths every year due to air pollution. Uh, and and uh, the picture at the bottom right are the floods in Pakistan a couple of months ago. So again, hopefully don't need to convince any of you of, of the uh, problem of climate change. Now, if we look at the ICT sector, so that's like information and communication technologies, uh, the forecast are... Uh, pretty grim in terms of like uh, increased carbon footprints in coming years. Uh, today, it's uh, between 1.8 and 2.8 of global greenhouse gas emission. Uh, and that's more than, than the entire aviation sector. Um, so that just to show the scale of, of carbon footprint. Uh, and yeah, just as a um, forecast, if we want the ICT sector, so uh, of which computing is part of, to stay on track for the 1.5 uh, degree of uh, temperature increase, uh, it would need quite drastic reductions uh, in, in the next uh, 20 years or so. So let's see why is it vaguely relevant to what we're doing in computational biology. Um, I've, I've just taken a few examples. So uh, a GWAS on a thousand traits in UK Biobank, which is a 500 thousand uh, people cohort, um, around 17.3 tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, that sounds like a lot. And if we put some context next to, next to it, it is uh, quite a lot. Uh, you could actually have breakfast in Paris every day for a year for that uh, for these emissions. So I, I would quite like that, but it, it's a big uh, it's a big number. Uh, it doesn't mean all analysis are quite so big. Uh, if we look at metagenome assembly, it runs a lot faster. You can see it's just one hour. It uses a lot of memory. Uh, and that's 14 kilograms. Much less, but it would still take a tree about 16 months to sequester that much carbon. And let's go even lower. Uh, RNA read alignment, for example, 240 grams. And the purpose of just these small examples, and I'll get, I'll get back to these uh, later in the talk, but the purpose of that is just to show that as expected, some analyses have very small carbon footprints, and some of them have very significant carbon footprint. Uh, so we, we just need to be uh, to be aware of those. And the main reason for that is, actually, what we're doing in science is usually trying to improve society or life on Earth to some extent, especially in bioinformatics or computational biology, where we spend a lot of time studying disease. Uh, and so it, it, the irony of also contributing to the problem uh, is a bit is a bit annoying, and so it's not to say it's the biggest problem we face, but just you know, because of what we're trying to do in the first place, it's probably worth investigating the costs as well. Uh, it's not a new idea uh, in medicine, for example. Some uh, physicians were a bit concerned about the ethics of flying to bioethics conferences, for example, in the in, in the time of climate change. And but all the, like these two papers were uh, published uh, ten or fifteen years ago, and so sadly um, uh, didn't get much traction back then. Okay, before I, I dive in into pure only computation, I just just want to give you an overview of the environmental impacts of of science and academia in general. Um, roughly, we can split it. We can talk about travels. Uh, you've probably seen some numbers uh, flying around. 
uh, wet lab related impacts. So, uh, you know, plastic usage, reagents, energy needs, uh, and so on. Computing, of course, uh, and then general offices uh, impacts. A few fun facts about travels. I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, climate change scientists tend to fly more than 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 other scientists, which is a bit ironic. Uh, and well, sort of unsurprisingly, the car the carbon footprint of scientists increase increases greatly with seniority. Now, the main problem of flying is mostly conferences. Uh, and and just a couple of numbers to to. To just contextualize, um, the full meeting of the American Geophysical Union, um, that was 80,000 tons of CO2 in a week. That's about three tons per scientist. Uh, just as a reminder, three tons is about the yearly goal in terms of uh, you know, moving forward for a person. Uh, and that's as much uh, greenhouse gas emission as the city of Edinburgh in the UK. Uh, or the, you know, another example is the Society for Neuroscience, 20,000 tons, uh, the same as a thousand medium-sized laboratories. So that just shows that, you know, hopefully uh, hybrid meetings are here, uh, are here to stay. Doesn't mean, you know, it won't replace face-to-face, -face, but it's good to have the option to not fly. Then wet lab, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because, uh, well, I don't do wet lab work. Um, and, but if you, if you, Many of you may be involved in wet lab, and if you don't know about it, do check out the LEAF framework that's driven uh, by Martin Farley from UCL. Uh, that's basically a lot of really good resources on how to make wet lab research more sustainable. Uh, so yeah, if you're not familiar with that, do check it out. And we're actually working with them at the moment to try to um, do the same thing for dry labs. So uh, keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Um, very briefly, let's let's just see how the, uh, the field came over the past few years. It's going to be very short. Uh, the it, it started just a few years ago, uh, so in the field of artificial intelligence and mostly natural language processing. So because large language models, they're, well, they're very large and they, they use uh, enormous quantities of, of uh, resources and, and core hours. And, and so that they started to be a bit worried about it. And so it started with Emma Struble's article and um, Roy Schwartz about green AI. And, and so that was very much the start and the field of AI has started to study it for, for quite a long time. Uh, astronomy did a really interesting work as well um, on, you know, just the impact of their field. They, they looked at computing, obviously, uh, because, uh, for example, the picture of a black hole I mentioned at the start, it's petabytes of data, uh, about five, I think, um, but also field work and, you know, building telescopes on the mountain and things like that. So really interesting. Uh, you would think health data science or like digital health in general uh, is at the forefront considering you know it's it's trying to uh, it has to deal with the health consequences of climate change but sadly not so much uh, and so there was a recent review that found uh, you know only 25 documents uh, relevant to that topic over 12 years um, which uh, is is not quite as many as we would hope but it's starting to change so it's great uh, bioinformatics well not a lot except uh, the work i'm going to talk about today but again, starting to change, so really good to see. Um, and some other fields are, are getting started, particle physics, for example, computational so social sciences, uh, neuroscience. Uh, neuroscience is doing a lot of work for, for a couple of years now. Uh, so that's also very promising. All right, so actually focusing on, on what we care about today, uh, computing. So we can split between two types of computing. On the one hand, we've got just you know, random everyday computing emails, watching Netflix, doing uh, a webinar like this one. Or and on the other hand, we have intense computation. And by that, I mean either running for a very long time or requiring a uh, lot of resources. So either many cores or just a lot of memory. And, and for today, we're going to focus on this second group. Um, just to give an idea of how big this second group is, uh, Exceed is a network of uh, research institutions in the U in the US uh, that's actually just closed. But uh, it was basically a lot of uh, universities putting together the data centers so that you could uh, share resources. And when a university is you know asleep, then some uh, then a university on another time zone could use it, for example. And what's interesting is they put out research statis uh, usage statistics, and we can see that in 2020, that's 24 million core hours being used every day. Uh, which uh, I still find mind blowing, and uh, it's interesting to see that it's actually uh, quite well sp split across all fields of science, uh, which 
just shows you know how important talking about it uh, is and yes it is a topic of interest regardless of you know it's not only a topic for ai it's very much something for all computational scientists um in biology i'm sure you know again you you're all very convinced of that just for the sake of it i went to look at uh, there was this paper the 100 top papers by nature or something and it was quite interesting and so i just went through and 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 listed the um bioinformatic tools quite a lot uh, of them made made the list and, and near to the top and and then when looking at citation counts and it's just just showing how widely used bioinformatic tools are in biology today so we have a problem again not saying it's the biggest problem in the world not saying you know uh, but it is it is a bit of a problem and something we need to account for um i initially thought that was like quite a well-shared opinion it turns out not everyone agrees uh, so the Google AI team has been a bit annoyed with uh, all these people poking around and showing the downsides of AI. Um, so they started to put a couple of um, quite biased papers out uh, saying, you know, AI is going to save the world, uh, which might be true. But, uh, you know, it doesn't mean we should ignore the, the downsides of it. And uh, unsurprisingly, um, Yann Le Kuhn, who is the head of AI at Facebook, uh, also agrees uh, with that assessment. Uh, but. Well, I don't quite. Uh, so we do have a problem. And, and you know, it's just important that as scientists, we just acknowledge all the, uh, you know, our contribution to, to climate change and, and see how we can mitigate this. So it's actually very good to see so many of you uh, here today live. All right. So let's try to understand how, well, where is this all coming from and what's this impact? So for the sake of today, uh, it doesn't really matter how you're doing your computation. So you can be using a laptop, a, you know, an HPC uh, facility, a data center. Uh, you can be using a, a big computer on your desktop. You can be using virtual machines. It, it doesn't matter. All the principles would apply the same way. Now, I'm, I'm aware that some of you uh, might just not do a lot of computation or, you know, but still curious about it. So I'll give a very quick introduction of what uh, HPC or high performance computing is. That's a very old fashioned picture of a computer. What interests us is there's an input, the keyboard and the mouse, and that sends information to uh, the, the processing unit, uh, which does all the calculation and everything. And then that sends the information back to the screen. Uh, and that's the output. That's how you get the information. Uh, now, we don't really need the two to be next to one another. We need the keyboard with us and we need the screen with us, but we can actually just split and, and put the a tower elsewhere you know if you have a long enough cable you can just put it in a room next door so then you don't you're not bothered by the noise or you have more space on your desk and thanks to the internet we can actually put it in a room halfway across the world and that's basically what a data center is and that's it it's just taking the processing unit and and you know moving it elsewhere now if you just do that then there's no real benefit the real benefit is when you start putting a lot of these computers together because it means you have a dedicated IT team that can look after them. So, you know, it's just much more efficient. Uh, when something breaks, you can just borrow another computer. You don't have to be out of a computer for a while. Uh, and if you need to do very intense computation, let's say, and, you know, you need to have 20 computers for 10 minutes, but then you don't want to buy 20 computers just for 10 minutes and then having these 20 computers for nothing. So instead, what you do is you just borrow 20 computers for 10 minutes and then you give them back and then someone else can use them. And, and then you can just share usage. What gets really cool is obviously everyone can access it or and you can even access it from a phone. As we said, all we need is a keyboard and a screen. You've got that on your smartphone. So ev everyone using all sorts of hardware can, can access it. And that's pretty much it, really. There's to know about it. So not, not that bad. Um, if we try to break down the environmental impacts of computing, uh, there are three... Uh, three main aspects. Yes, cloud computing is a kind of HPC. It's exactly the same thing. Um, so there are three environmental aspects. The first one is um, life cycle footprint. So by life cycle, I mean, I mean um, manufacturing the device initially, uh, then shipping it across the world, wherever you sell it, then using it for its entire lifetime, and then disposing of it. And what's interesting is when we look at consumer devices, so by consumer, I mean, uh, you know, um, a phone, a tablet, a laptop. In this case, uh, 70 to 80% of this entire footprint is only down to production. 
uh, which means that actually keeping your devices for longer is the one single best things you can do in these cases. It doesn't really matter, you know, reducing usage doesn't make a big difference because you're only acting on these remaining 20%. Um, so that's why it's really important to try to keep devices for as long as possible and, and repair them when possible. Uh, the share is lower for data centers because as we saw before, the whole point of a data center uh, is to use the hardware like all the time as much as possible. And so, you know, usage is, is obviously higher. So the share of production is only 10 to 20%, but it's still, it's still important to at least account for sustainability when deciding renewing policies. Too often these renewing policies are only decided on um, uh, costs and warranties. Now, long-term data storage, and I'm sure that's something uh, a lot of you are familiar with um, because, well, especially in biology, there's the, a lot of situations where actually we don't need a lot of computing. You know, you, you're very happy using just one core, but we need to store massive, uh, massive amount of data. So just if we look at the breakdown of a, uh, the energy bill of a data center, only half for the average data center, only half the power is actually delivered to the computers. Uh, the other half, it's 40% uh, for overheads, which mostly means keeping everything uh, nice and cool, and 10% for storage. So 10% is not a lot, but again, you know, 10% of a big number uh, is still a big number. Um, and if you want to estimate the carbon footprint of storing data, it's quite hard. It, it varies a lot depending on hardware, but a good rule of thumb is 10 kilograms of CO2 equivalent to store one terabyte of data for a year. And, uh, you know, that can vary between like three or 60, but 10, 10 kilograms is a good uh, order of magnitude to remember. So it just shows it's important to not store unnecessary data. All right. And then we get to the main part, which is actually powering the computer, the part we you probably were expected uh, expecting to talk about. And it, it can get slightly more complicated, but um, actually we can keep it quite simple. The idea is to say, to calculate the carbon footprint of running a model or running some computations, um, you need to know how much energy you need. And that depends on the software you're using and the hardware you have. And then you need to know how this energy was produced in the first place. So what's the carbon footprint of producing that much energy? And that's called carbon intensity. And that mostly depends on where you are in the world because you, know, you have no control about the carbon mix and the energy mix of, of your country. So if you if we focus on the energy needs first, um, I promise this is the kind of the only math we have in the slides today. Um, if you're interested, I'm, I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail, but if you're interested into why it looks like that, uh, you can check out uh, our paper about green algorithms and, and we kind of go into a lot of details about why some things are included and some are not, uh, or happy to come back to it uh, in the questions. But first, it depends on running time, uh, quite obviously. Uh, an interesting example, and, and you know, I'm going to come back to this chart later so you can ignore it. If you just look at the first two blue bars here, um, what's interesting is that it's basically running the exact same GWAS, the one I was talking about earlier, uh, using the first version of Bolt LMM, which, which is the, uh, uh, the numbers I presented in the introduction, or using the later version 2.3. And you can see by just updating the software, you can reduce carbon footprint by uh, three quarter. Um, which is quite impressive. And, and I know we all hate updating packages or updating software because you do that and then it breaks everything and then you have to spend ages fixing it. But once in a while, it, it might have, it might be worth it. Uh, then we just have to account for, um, we just have to account for, you know, processing calls and memory. Um, and that's, that's mostly it. And then we get to the efficiency of the data center. So there's this little number called PUE, so power usage effectiveness. Uh, and that's just a way to measure how much energy is used for overheads. Um, so that, you know, the closer to one it is, it's always higher than one, obviously, but uh, the closer to one, the more efficient the data center. An average data center nowadays is around 1.57 and the best data centers in the world are around 1.1, um, just for context. So that shows that actually having a, a very efficient data center is, is a great way to completely painlessly reduce carbon footprints. Uh, at least uh, from the user uh, perspective. So we've sorted energy used. I hope everyone's happy with that. Uh, if not, just put stuff in the Q&A and we'll get back to that at the end. But uh, then we can focus on the second part, which is carbon intensity. 
And that's where there are great discrepancies between countries. Um, so if you look at that, um, if just because you know some countries have very low carbon uh, production methods and some have high carbon methods, if you run exactly the same analysis in the in Switzerland compared to running it in Australia, you're going to emit 74 times less carbon just because energy uh, electricity in Switzerland is mostly based on hydro, while electricity in Australia um, is mostly based on coal. And, that, and that's a bit that's a bit crazy considering you know it's the same analysis using exactly the same hardware and and the UK for example is here or you know wherever you you're based in the world um so this this chart is based on like yearly averages based on government reports and things like that if you want something more um current you have the electricity map uh app which is which is really good and basically it shows in real time how the electricity is produced you can also have like yearly averages or monthly averages uh, and for example uh, switzerland is a good example because it's really low on the chart before but actually depending on the time of year uh, sometimes they're much higher and sometimes they can be uh worse than the uk even um so it's quite interesting but that's yeah so if you're interested about your country uh you you can look at that and and that's a, sometimes it's broken down by like states in the us for example or regions um all right so that just shows that you know choosing the location of computing facility is uh can be quite important and 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 basically we sorted we know how to estimate the energy needed for to run computation we know how to estimate uh how to find the carbon intensity uh and so now that you can do that it just shows that it's it's quite important to well raise awareness but also you know acknowledge this contribution as we said at the start so if you can just try to estimate and report at the end of a project the carbon footprint just maybe just for you but you can also share it around you just say okay well that's that's at least i know what's the total environmental cost of running these these experiments uh, but then you can also do it the other way around and before starting a project say okay i think this big project that's what i think the carbon cost is going to be uh, and then you can decide whether you think it's worth it. And in many cases, it will be, and that's completely fine. The point is not at all to say, oh, we should stop science, uh, but it's to say, okay, maybe if, you know, the, the big model is just something that identify cute cats on the picture, um, cute cats are important, but still, you know, maybe it's not worth uh, several tons of CO2. So these kind of cost-benefit cost benefit analysis are quite important. Um Something else that that uh, that is is especially in biology. You know, we tend to estimating how the cost of running the model once is good, but actually the model we never run it once. We fail a few times, then we have to debug it, then we have to you know optimize parameters, and then we try to duplicate it a few times just to make sure we didn't break anything. Um, and so that just although a lot of you know many runs are unavoidable, uh, sometimes uh, you know many runs also are avoid avoidable. So. And obviously, you know, if you run it twice, you just emit twice as much carbon. It's quite straightforward like that. Okay, so now it gets us to, uh, we were thinking, okay, that, that's great. But if I, you know, stop the webinar here, uh, I'm not sure it would be really easy for many of you to estimate this carbon footprint. So what we realized is having the theory is good, but what we need is, is you know, the kind of a standardized framework. And actually we called it a framework first because we researchers and we love to create new frameworks, but actually what would really be useful was, was a tool, just a tool so that scientists can easily calculate carbon footprints. And when I started talking about this topic two years ago, uh, my, my next slide would be like, well, there's nothing out there. So we had to build one, but actually now I'm, it's really good. There has been, um, Quite a few. So uh, that's are a few tools that are out there. They, you'll notice that they are mostly Python packages and mostly meant for machine learning. As I as I explained at the start, that's kind of how the field started, and that's where a lot of energy is dedicated. Uh, so if you're doing machine learning on Python, then uh, these packages are great. If you do Python for something else, you may be able to use some of them. If not, it's a bit of a pickle. And, and that's that's how we started. We said, okay, well, it's, it's excellent that people are looking at it for machine learning, but a large part of computational science doesn't involve machine learning and doesn't necessarily involve Python. Um, so we wanted to create something that any scientist can use 
uh, regardless of you know the field of application. So we created the green algorithm calculator. Um, so you know you can check it out if you're curious now uh, or, or save it somewhere. But basically, it's a very straightforward online calculator. Uh, no need to install anything. You just put in how long your model runs for. You just explain what kind of hardware you're using. Um, where you are in the world and you can customize a bit more but you know if you don't know more information you just leave it there and you leave the default value and it spits out the um uh, the carbon footprint energy need um and things like that so it's quite uh yeah that's that's how it started with okay well we need an easy tool for everyone to use it so something as anna mentioned at the start developed with jason Greeley from melbourne and michael Inouye from cambridge uh, and, you know, you can, uh, because people don't like to read papers, so we we kind of put the important information there. So if you want to catch up, it's just basically what the formula is and, and a few definitions and, and uh, a few practical uh, practical aspects as well. Um, all the data, all the code, everything's open source on GitHub. So, you know, if you're curious about why do I get this value, just go on there and, and poke around. And if you find a mistake, please do, you know, just raise an issue on GitHub, for example. It's, it works on mobile and stuff like that. And, and so we, we put it out in, in March 2020, uh, shortly after um, after starting writing, on, uh, working on it. And, and my first question when I first released it was, do people care? Or is it, you know, just me as a PhD student uh, creating this small app um, and you know the study was like not that many users but interestingly it's really grown over time and uh, I mean just the fact that you know it's something like 120 of you at the moment online uh, just shows the interest um, and, and now we're around 200 to 300 users every week which well for this at the scale of the internet is not that many but for something so niche it's I'm quite happy with uh, and what I'm really happy is this map in the bottom right because it just shows that there's a, a widespread interest in this topic all over the world uh and and a lot of people have been talking to said yeah you know i was curious about the carbon footprint of my computation i just didn't really have a tool to do it um and so that's that's been really good to um yeah to see the uptake and actually the next slide is kind of an exclusive to this webinar because uh we realized we're starting to have a lot of resources and just you know people struggle to to find all of them i'm going to talk a bit more later so we uh, we basically have a, a, a brand new website, so it's not quite on. So if you go to Green Algorithm, you're just going to get the calculator for now, but it's coming It's coming very soon. Um, and yeah, it basically, it will be a, a one place. The calculator will still be there. We're just going to move it to a slightly different URL, but you'll still find it. And basically, we're going to put you know, uh, a, a tutorials on how to use the different tools, uh, maybe some training resources. We list, you know, just, just a one place where you can find a lot of resources on how to make computing more sustainable. Um, and if you can't wait to see it online, it's actually already online uh, since yesterday. So uh, it's just at the green algorithms.github.io. So if you're very curious, uh, you can already uh, you can already find it. All right. So a few interesting things uh, we've learned along the way. Uh, one is more calls is not always better. And I'm, I mean, I'm not surprising anyone with that. Uh, what I mean by that is sometimes, you know, going from 10 to 20 calls, you're going to save the, reduce the running time by maybe five minutes but you're going to increase carbon footprint significantly so it's worth it's it's worth you know thinking oh is the improvement in performance worth this carbon cost and and, and sometimes it is but it, it may not always be um you know the gpus are use more energy than a cpu usually so it's sometimes the gpu is so much better at the task that actually is going to result in in a lot of reduced carbon footprints uh but you know sometimes sometimes not uh memory matters and that's something that sometimes i struggle to convince uh ai people of but uh i rarely struggle to convince computational biologists because in ai mostly you know the algorithm may only load you know a few images at a time and and that can be fine um well, like in computational biology, sometimes you're only going to need a single CPU because, you know, you can't parallelize anything, but actually you need to load 200 gigabytes of genetic data at the same time. Uh, and that's where actually the carbon footprint is going to come from memory. It's not going to come from processing cores. So uh, it's important to account for it. Um, the information is often missing. So we don't either about the hardware, about the facilities, about the tools we're using. Uh, more information is needed. and Cloud computing, so uh, some of you mentioned it in the chat. Uh, it can be good, not always, and I'm gonna I'm gonna expand on that in a minute. And uh, sadly, offsetting is not a solution. So let's just stick to offsetting for now. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, offsetting is when you emit, let's say, a ton of CO2, but you buy an offsetting credit. So you spend some money to uh, someone who says, well, we've planted enough trees that, you know, your ton of CO2 has been removed, or we, we're supporting low carbon project. And the more I talk with uh, environmental experts and offsetting experts and and their their unanimous conclusion seems to be that offsetting doesn't work and actually has more unintended consequences and one of the problem of offsetting is they assume that the tree that has been planted you know is going to stay where it is for the next 50 years and do exactly you know second as much carbon for 50 years which which is not very realistic what happens if it burns or even sometimes it's not involving planting a new tree, but it's just buying a tree in an existing forest. But in practice for the environment, you know, whether you buy this credit or not doesn't make a difference. So for all these reasons, uh, yeah, offsetting um, is is not really, uh, not, not the solution. And uh, what matters is in the first place, reducing emissions as much as possible. Now, cloud computing. So uh, I was saying earlier, uh, yes, cloud computing or using your institutional data center works exactly the same way. The only reason we call it cloud is because you don't know where the data center is, but it's exactly the same thing. Two reasons why it can be quite good is you can choose the location. So let's say you're a scientist in Australia. No, not your fault that actually, you know, your electricity is very high carbon, but you can maybe use a cloud provider where the data center is in Switzerland and all of a sudden your carbon footprint is going to be uh, much lower. Uh, so that's that's a that's an, uh, a good option. And also because they have very large data centers and because, you know, overheads is money, uh, this uh, cloud provider spend a lot of money and a lot of resources to optimize these data centers. So they tend to have extremely energy efficient data centers. Now, few limitations that come with it. This efficiency thing, um, although they will advertise average PUE and they say, you know, our, our data centers can be that efficient, it doesn't mean that the particular data center you're using for your particular project is actually one of the efficient ones. Maybe, unluckily, you ended up with one of the old facilities that is actually less efficient than the one you have in your institutions. So uh, it, it's important to be quite... Uh, quite careful of that, especially because they don't always make the information available. Uh, and um, a lot of cloud providers claim carbon neutrality, but that's mostly based on offsetting, not based on zero carbon. So um, yeah, that's just something to be aware of. Okay, uh, so now we get to uh, carbon footprint of computational biology. And it does feel a bit silly getting to that point half an hour after the start of the webinar when it's the title of the webinar, but hopefully getting a bit of understanding of where the carbon footprint comes from can be can be useful uh, useful to you. Uh, and, and that's actually how the project happened because we started thinking, oh, you know, it's going to be a two weeks project. We're just going to estimate the carbon footprint of what we're doing in our lab. And then we realized, as I was saying, that there was no way to do it. So we had to build the tools first and, and it was kind of a long journey back to solving the initial question, which is what's the carbon footprint of biology or computational biology in particular. Uh, so that was a, a work led by uh, Jason Greeley with lots of collaborators in the lab. Um, and, and so we, we put out this paper, carbon footprint of bioinformatics. And so what we wanted is to just sample a few key, uh, a few key mo uh, tools for common tasks to just get give an overview of the field. Um, and you know you can see we have protein docking, um, RNA sequencing, metagenome assembly, and things like that. And if we zoom out, we can even fit GWAS in the frame. Uh, so here's a bit uh, more detail about each task. Um, I'm not going to go in in great details. If you you know if you're really interested in one particular aspect and know how we estimated and everything, just yeah, uh, feel free to check out the paper. Um, if your reaction now is oh, but you know my subfield of computational biology is not uh is not represented uh i'm very sorry for that and please do it just you know or if you figure that we not we didn't estimate the right tools uh again just you the best place to do it uh part of the reason we couldn't test everything is we didn't want to run the computation ourselves because it was a bit silly to emit a lot of greenhouse gases to tell people to be more responsible so we had to work off um benchmarks and it's quite rare in a paper that you have all the information you need, which is, you know, what hardware is being used, what's the runtime, uh, and, and things like that. Where is it located? This kind of thing. So, um, yeah. So we didn't test everything, but uh, do do check it out. And 
anything that's missing, please put it up online and uh, tag us. I would be very curious to know to know more about it. It's not only computational biology. We we kind of try to show that it was across fields. So we did a bit of uh, playing around with weather forecast algorithms, which are uh, notoriously complicated or a bit in in uh, a bit in physics as well. Um, so again, that was in the original green algorithms paper. Now, if that's probably the only message, well, not the only, but if there's only if you only want to take one message away from this webinar, that's probably that that computing is not free, and it does feel free in institutions. Uh, I guess uh, if there are any PIs around here who are footing the bill, they will disagree. But uh, you know, mostly the cost of computing is very low, and it's very rarely a bottleneck. There is very very rarely a situation where you you know you want to do a project and you think, oh, I can't really do it because the computing is going to be too much. The, the free allocation is so big on institutional servers that usually, especially as a, as a PhD student, as a postdoc, you just you know run whatever you need, and it feels like unlimited computing at no cost. And and the 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 whole idea about about, about today is to say, um, you know, not to say we shouldn't do science, not at all. I mean, like yeah, full disclosure. My background is machine learning and and AI, and so you know I'm I'm fully guilty of anything I talk about today. Uh, but it's just to say. There is a cost, so let's let's treat it like any other cost and be um and be a bit mindful of it. And it doesn't always have to be a trade-off. It's not always oh I'll have to sacrifice performance or accuracy just for the sake of um uh, of of the environment. Sometimes it's a win-win, as we saw. Sometimes the model will get better. Um, sometimes yeah, the model will get better uh, because it gets a lot faster and lower carbon. So, you know, many, many win-win strategies happen. It was really good to see that it kind of triggered more investigations um, in, in recent years, which which has been, well, as I said, really good to see. Uh, but, and then we realized, well, okay, public publishing papers is good. And, you know, the calculator hopefully has been useful, but it doesn't really, well, you know, it's, it's quite, it's hard to get the, the, how to be more sustainable out of a, a you know technical paper so either you 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 end up in one of our talks but we then worked with uh, Alex Bateman from Emberly BI and we worked on um you know putting together simple rules on how to make computing more environmentally friendly um and so that was uh, that was like the next. Uh, it's basically a summary. I'm not going to go through that in details. It's a uh, it, it covers what I've been discussing today. But if you want to share one paper uh, to share it, what people can do easily, uh, that's kind of an easy one, uh, easy to read, quite short one to share. Now, what's next? Moving forward, um, on the hardware software front, there's the question of specialized versus general carbon footprint calculator. So what do I mean by that? The online calculator is very flexible. You can use it regardless of your field of study, regardless of the hardware you're using, you can always use it, but it can be a bit not very practical. Let's say if you're running hundreds of jobs and they all have slightly different specs, then, then it would be a bit cumbersome. So what we would like actually in this case, and you know, it's something on the HPC cluster, you just want to log in and then say, what is my carbon footprint? between you know 1st of January and 1st of June. And because I really didn't want to write my thesis, I um, I coded something like that. So if we zoom in here, we can see that, you know, it gives it basically all these HPC facilities, they log everything you do because they have to charge you. They don't charge you a lot of money, but they still have to charge you. So what we can do is you can have a piece of code that just crawls through the logs after the fact, you know, it doesn't have to be running all the time. It just goes through the logs, pull all the information and calculate carbon footprints based on that. Uh, so we called it uh, green algorithms for HPC. Um, and, you know, it gives you metrics. Some of them I wish I didn't know, like the impact of all my failed jobs. Uh, that's a bit heartbreaking. Uh, but other than that, it, it's it's a lot more accurate, obviously, and, and quite painless. The, the downside is it needs to be customized to each platform. It's all on GitHub. Uh, we've been trialing it on Cambridge CSD3, but if you, um, you know, if you want to try it in your institutions, like a few institutions have been giving it a go uh, in the UK and abroad. But yeah, if you want to try it, uh, it's very easy to install. You don't need any permissions or anything. Uh, it's all on the GitHub, and well, it, and it will be very like all better detailed on the website soon. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, if you just get in touch, I'm very happy to help about setting it up. And if you set it up and it works, please do get in touch and let me know. I'm I'm quite curious to know, you know, how it's being used and just how it works uh, in general. Um, 
what else do we need? We need more transparency. I've, I've rented a lot about that, so uh, hopefully that makes sense. But what we've tried to do in the lab is to just, at the end of our papers, we just put we just put some acknowledgements of what the carbon footprint of running the project was. Um, and, and so we, we just put that at the end of our papers and it kind of motivated other people to do it. So uh, I've been really happy to see that. Um, it's, yeah, it's just good to raise, it's a good way to raise awareness and also people are a bit more, have a better idea of what a, the carbon footprint of a project tends to be. Uh, sometimes it can be used to just show that, you know, your model that is also a lot faster also happens to be better for the environment. Uh, back then, Twitter decided it was sensitive content, but if we brave and click, uh, it just shows that, you know, because the model is faster, it's also better for the environment. So it goes back to, you know, win-win strategies I was mentioning before. Um, and then and then we need to move from like all this estimating thing to uh, actually reducing. So that includes, you know, including including it in bioinformatic training, like with webinars like today's, um, but also mentioning sustainability in software documentations. Uh, there's always the debate of, is it better to centralize all the data centers rather than having, um, you know, individual facilities? Uh, they are more efficient, but at the same time, they have larger environmental impacts that has to be discussed. Um, and there's this rebound effect. And the idea is to say, if you make a tool 10 times more efficient, um, the only consequence of that is going to be uh, people using it 100 times more. And it's brilliant. That's what enables science. But at the same time, it doesn't really solve the carbon problem. And that's why we can't only rely on technology. And there's this tendency. Uh, it's the same in aviation, for example. You know, you, you will have people saying, oh, but we don't need to fly less. Let's just wait for planes to be, you know, zero carbon. And, and we just know that we can't afford to wait that long. And it's a bit the same with, with computing is to say, oh, we can just wait until all data centers in the entire world is powered by renewable energy. The answer is yes. And when that happens, I'm very happy to throw away all these, you know, all, all these slides. But in the meantime, we, we do need to change how we think about computing cost and uh, maybe start to challenge, you know, is more data, more AI always, always good? Um, and obviously open science will have a critical role in that because if you share your model, if you share your data, then people don't have to rerun computation and it saves a lot of wasted uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I quite like how the, the role society has put it. Uh, they say that, you know, digital technologies need to be um, need to be energy proportionate. So it just means they need to offset their environmental consequences and they don't define how. Obviously, that's very complicated and that's kind of something for each scientist to decide whether the research is worth it. But just having this moment before starting a massive computing project and just think, okay, do I think it's worth it? And can I be a bit more environmentally conscious about it? Just having this like little break uh, can make a world of difference. Um, who is involved? Short answer is everyone. Uh, you know, funding bodies, journals, PIs, training teams, HPC teams obviously have a key role to play here. Uh, but also graduate students and postdoc because, well, we we all know they're the one doing the science. Um, so it, it's, you know, there are a lot of graduate students and students-led movements, especially like the Green Lab movements in the Netherlands that do excellent work. So, you know, maybe you can get close to a similar movement in your institution, say there is one. Um, and we also need to involve industry partners because uh, a lot of computation is being done in industry. So we, we can't just stay in academia. We, we need to move a bit out. Uh, funding bodies have started to do some uh, great work around that. Uh, there's lots of initiatives, uh, mostly to estimate carbon footprint at this stage, but hopefully moving towards more sustainability from the Wellcome Trust, from UKRI. Um, and I'll just finish on that, which is we need to keep in mind that actually when we do a cost benefit analysis, it's a bit biased because the people who will suffer the cost are not the same people who will benefit from the, you know, improvement or the latest technology we develop for um, AI or for health. And so it's, it's a, it's a complicated problem and something we have to be, uh, we have to be mindful of. All right. Uh, so I'll just thank uh, all the collaborators, uh, obviously in the lab in Cambridge and in Melbourne, uh, but also at Emble EBI. Uh, thanks again to Emble EBI for organizing that. And if you have any questions, just um, yeah, just email. Uh, very happy to answer to emails or usually when I, when I put updates about the app or updates about the different tools or stuff like that on Twitter. So, uh, so, so we can get in touch there as well. And yeah, very happy to um, answer, answer any questions. 
thank you very much uh, for a very interesting and, and thought-provoking talk i can see um, so many comments in the chat showing that people are very interested to learn more about this topic and um, hopefully um, we'll, we'll go on to read and, and learn and, and try more about this um, as as many people have have asked yes we will absolutely share the slides um, because there are so many links and um, articles that are uh, summarized in that that I'm sure lots of you want to go on to look at um, we will be um, sending an email out tomorrow so just in the same way you got your Zoom invite, you will see uh, an email that has the link to the recording and also to the slides there. Um, so that will be tomorrow that you get that. Um, just uh, before we move on to the questions, there's a couple already in the Q&A box. Um, so if you do want to add more into that, please do so. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of upcoming webinars that we have. So um, back to a sort of more uh bioinformatics tools perhaps focused um a couple of webinars coming up we have a question and answer session to go along with the bio curation uh, online uh, e-learning collection um and also an e uh, a webinar on the automated annotation in uniprox that might be of interest to some of you um but for now i think we can take a look at some questions so the first one that we had uh, from Tanishree, what are your thoughts on using older secondhand equipment um, responsibly versus buying new more efficient equipment, um, particularly considering things like the manufacturing costs? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And the answer to that is uh, you just need to do the math, basically, because, um, you know, in the case of a data center, for example, um, Actually, although the, the you know sustainability is not often included in renewing policy because the hardware is being used so much, um, basically having more efficient hardware in maybe six months or a year, you're going to offset the manufacturing cost of it. And so actually it makes sense to change hardware provided you keep it, you know, maybe more than one year or something like that. Uh, and so, you know, in many situations, it may, may, it may make sense to um, to include you know, to change hardware. I guess the important thing is to make sure that when assessing the production footprint, everything is included. And it's not only, you know, the, the energy used to produce it, but also rare metal extraction and the environmental impacts. And it's information that is not always easy to use, but a lot more manufacturers now are reporting on that. Then, well, whether we trust the, the values are, is a different question, but um, yeah, it, it yeah, it's, it's a case by case basis. I'd say usually for consumer devices, it will be really hard to offset the it will be really hard to offset the manufacturing cost by just having more efficient hardware because the manufacturing cost compared to usage is just so big unless you have something that's incredibly bad poor uh, poor efficiency uh, but you know if it's just a slightly older laptop versus changing for slightly newer one when you do the same work it, um, it's unlikely to make a difference but yeah okay thank you i'm sure that's a very thought provoking thing for for many um, looking at another question here. So um, from the point of view of developers, uh, are there studies where different data structures, algorithms, et cetera, in terms of their power usage? So you know, they're talking here about memory access, caching, data transfer, that kind of thing. Yeah, so uh, there's in the question, there's the thing about efficient languages such as Rust. Uh, so they, there are a few papers, actually. I think it was mostly driven from astronomy. I don't have the... Um, I don't have the, the exact title in mind, but, but I'm sure you can find it. And there's this like kind of famous graph showing like that Python and R as about as poorly optimized and as energy hungry as everything else. Uh, so they're the worst ones. And, and you know, C++ or C is, is a lot more efficient and Rust is probably uh, up there as well in terms of efficiency. So yes, there has been a few studies showing that some programming languages are more efficient. Then there's the question, obviously, is like, if you have to redo the package yourself and you code it in a very inefficient way, then it doesn't matter the language is efficient. So, um, you know, usually you're stuck in a language because the rest of your community is in this language and, and you know, all the softwares and all the packages are in this language, so you can't really change it. But yes, if, if possible, uh, languages do have a big impact. Now, yes, algorithmic choices and you know what how how often you access memory fun fact it doesn't really matter for memory because memory is terrible for power efficiency so the only thing that roughly the only thing that decides how much power is used by memory is the memory available but uh, for cpus it has a huge impact and not enough work is being done on that so we don't really understand well enough 
how power is being used by the different components. And uh, they, I think there's a, a, a super wide field for developers and computer scientists to, to help us understand that better. All right, thank you. Um, we have we have a question that I'm I'm not sure there there will be such a thing, but someone is asking if there's a an NGO that's working on on this kind of thing. So things around uh, algorithms making them more efficient. I don't think there is, not that I know of. Um, uh, I know some people have uh, work on that, and you know they will like usually because they're frustrated by how inefficient the package they're using is, so then they built a new one. Uh, I think it can give some motivation to some people because sometimes the software is widely used and it's slightly less, less slightly inefficient. But, you know, you're like, oh, well, people are going to use twice as much time running it. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's like four hours instead of two. It's rarely business critical. You do it overnight. It doesn't matter. If we include in the equation that it's also emitting five times as much carbon because of resources needed, then maybe some people who are working in this field will be like, oh, actually, I'm going to spend the time optimizing it because I know that, you know, I don't care about the running time, but I care about the environment. And so we could, uh, but I don't think there are NGOs. I think it's more like scientists taking on the, the battle and, you know, just, just focus on what's in your field. And if you can optimize it, then brilliant. Absolutely. All right, and some, some very big questions here, I think. Um, so there's a, a question asking about uh, comparing the analysis of computational cost versus the benefit the work produces to humanity. But I think that's a very difficult one to answer. Yeah, so that's a bit like um, uh, what the the Royal Society report. So if you want to check it out, it's it's the I mean it's really easy to find. Or when you get the slide, there's the screenshot. But, but basically, they they don't really define it. They, they they discuss it in a bit more detail. But they talk about energy proportion. Um, energy proportionate or something like that. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, I've got a brain freeze here. It doesn't matter. Um, but basically, they, they explain that, yes, it, you need to quantify it in some way, but you can't define it as a general method, you know, because some tools will try to reduce to tackle climate change. So they will actually directly result in carbon reductions. Some tools will just make you know, the, the energy grid more efficient. So these are easy to quantify. You just say, okay, I think it's going to save that much carbon. So obviously it's worth doing a tenth of that in terms of uh, research and development. But some of them are just going to try to cure people, which, you know, it may result in like more people on the planet and more greenhouse gas emissions. And so actually, you know, it's hard to quantify in these cases. And it's the same with money. Can you, you know, it's really hard to say, oh, is this experiment worth the money? You never really know. But no one would start an experiment saying, it may cost me a hundred pounds. It, it may cost me a million pounds. No one knows. Let's get started. We'll figure it out as we go. It doesn't really happen. And, and so the argument is that we probably should do the same with carbon. We're not going to have a perfect formula that decides if we, you know, if it's worth doing, but we can at least, in many cases, scientists will have a gut feeling of, you know, yes, clearly it's worth it or no, clearly it's not worth it. And I don't think there will be that many situations where it's very doubtful. But very difficult question, and I'm sure people will be working on it. Okay. Um, so this is the question that it, it came up um, in the chat as well. Um, and you mentioned about doing um, using data centers in countries like Switzerland or Iceland versus somewhere like Australia. And and are they say they're saying you know, is that really going to make a difference, or because I'm running it in a different country, is that still going to cause things like uh, cost from data transfer? Well, the cost from data well, it depends. If if you know if it's just sending an email, yes, send the email from where you are. Don't don't try to like send the email from abroad. But uh, if it's to run an intense computation, I think that the data transfer will be quite rapidly offset. It. Um, the question is. In theory, if it's just you doing it, yeah, and then yes, it's much better to do it in a in a low carbon country. Um, now, if we think about transferring an entire, let's say, Emboli BI decide to transfer its entire infrastructure to Iceland, then it's difficult because basically you you know there's a finite amount of electricity Iceland can produce, and so the result of that might be that Iceland has to get emergency coal based generators to to produce to you know to support the new energy need so so then it's it's a very complicated question when we talk about transporting electricity elsewhere do we you know do we really is it really beneficial but i think in the long run yes because uh maybe it will encourage you know countries to say okay well we're losing all these data centers infrastructures because they don't want to be there anymore maybe maybe it's worth but um 
if you start getting into the detail, it's a uh, well, it's a complicated topic. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so I think we'll just take one more question because we're getting near to uh, half past the hour here. Um, and so you mentioned very briefly about this, but you mentioned about um, the LEAF framework uh, for the, the wet lab side of things, but also that there was going to be or is in development a computational equivalent. Could you yeah, mention a bit so, about that? Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. And that's exactly what the LEAF team thought, because a lot of people started to ask them about it. So we're working, uh, we're working with the LEAF team on it at the moment. It should come up, uh, you know, it, it, it's, we, we, we're finalizing the criteria and, we, you know, they're, 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 they're putting the whole website together. So it, it's a, they're doing a lot of work to, to get this up and running. But I'd say in the coming months, I don't want to give a deadline, but, you know, in the coming few months, there should be a LEAF for computational or LEAF for dry lab kind of thing coming out that should answer that. So okay, so that will come out via the LEAF website. So that yes, yeah, yeah, you're going to, uh, the, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. keep an eye on LEAF. That's great. Um, so thank you. I think uh, we'll leave the questions there for that for now. I know I know there are more and there will always be more, um, but it was great to start this discussion. It was now. great. Uh, if, if I didn't answer uh, some of your question, questions, feel free to email me and yeah, very happy to answer them through emails. Cool. Great, thank you. And we'll pop your email address in that follow-up email tomorrow as well. Um, yeah, so excellent. if anyone needs to get in contact. Yeah. Okay, so I think that just leaves me now to say thank you very much to Loic for joining us for the webinar today.